Uh, we have, as usual, lots to discuss. And for our top news stories, the, the Amazon forest carbon emissions exceed their uptake. So as the Amazon burns and dies, what about it? Well, Richard says, is this a tipping point? Will the Amazon changing from carbon sink to carbon source be the end of us all? In technology, why electric cars will take over sooner than you think. I don't know what you think, but anyway. <laughs> And for our graphene story or materials, now we can develop lactose-free milk from graphene. Ha! Now in flight and space, billionaires Branson and Bezos bound for space. And one question some people are asking, should they stay there? On the environment, this story says that the 2020s, so the next few years, are the make it or break it decade to address climate crisis. If we don't do it now, what about it? In biology, should the WHO lead on genome editing policy with CRISPR and all that? Genome editing some say it could bring catastrophe, and others that it could bring cures to terrible diseases. Which will it be? Should it be controlled? And if we think it should be, is it possible to do so? Under our human story, the neuroprosthesis, this is about a working AI brain computer interface that apparently can restore words to man who is paralyzed. And our last story, in terms of health, unlocking the gut microbiome and its massive significance to our health. What can we do? So Richard, that's what we'll talk about. And what's this in our top story about the Amazon forest carbon emissions exceeding uptake as the Amazon burns and dies. With you asking, is this a tipping point? With the Amazon changing from carbon sink to carbon source? Well, this one is uh, the sign of trouble, I think, no matter how you look at it. Uh, the Amazon as a region has been absorbing an enormous amount of uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And with what is happening in the Southeast Amazon, uh, that is changing. And this area, this half of the Amazon has gone into an irreversible uh, collapse. Uh, what I read in another article is that uh, this has uh, killed or severely damaged 2.1 trillion trees. And to get an idea how many trees that is, uh, you know, there is this trillion tree project to help global warming all over the world by planting a trillion trees. And uh, we lost twice that many trees in the Amazon. So uh, what is happening is that uh, the climate in the Southeast Amazonia is warming and drying. And uh, before the forest was cooling and humidifying the reason, but it has crossed a tipping point. And they say with this kind of forest in the Amazon, if uh, you lose more than 30% of the trees, then uh, the, the climate is not capable of continuing to support that humid environment. And we have lost more than that 
in this part of the Amazon, and uh, now it is just getting too hot and dry. And now part of what is either ironic or classically stupid about this is that the forest was cut and burned to make way for soybean farming. And the only problem is that drier conditions follow this loss of forest and these drier conditions have caused a net loss in soybean production overall in Brazil. So what they're doing to grow more soybeans is causing them to grow fewer soybeans while at the same time uh, destroying this uh, resource in the Amazon. And uh, what the climate scientists say is that there is no going back to the rainforest once this critical number of trees is lost. And as a extra special bonus, what the scientists are saying now is that the increasing temperatures in the Amazon are causing an unexpected increase in methane uh, emissions. And methane is uh, far worse than carbon dioxide. So here we have a case of uh, environmental stewardship that is gone very wrong. And it turns out that it is going wrong for uh, reasons that uh, are terrible anyway. So what do you think about the Amazon, the Amazon? Well, I, 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 I would have been. I wonder if the people that are causing that are aware of what they're doing. I can't tell you. Uh, somebody else will have to comment about the wisdom of Brazil's leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not well, convinced. And the, the president of Brazil is actually a, is exactly like Donald Trump. He's a twin of Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro. Yes, that's what I've heard. He's very anti and business and all that. Yeah, he's terrible. But he's very popular among a segment of the population, so he does have a base. He's very much like Trump. I wonder if um, what's happening in uh, California and the whole West Coast, whether that also went through phases similar, except on a different scale, of course, and whether the Brazil, the Mato Grosso in Brazil, could end up like the West Coast with huge fires and, you know, uncontrolled temperatures. Wow. What do you, I, what do you think? Richard? I think that's already happened. Except the difference within Brazil and the West Coast is in Brazil, the fires have been set by people trying to clear off those nasty trees so they can grow more soybeans. And on the West Coast, uh, for example, in British Columbia, there were all those forest fires during uh, the recent hot streak. And the forest fires, many of them were set by lightning. And the lightning was caused by the changed weather because it was so hot. So one heat condition and disaster leads to another sometimes. But in Brazil, they're all doing this. We don't need the lightning. We're doing it ourselves. Should, if we want to move on to technology, why do you think that electric cars will take over sooner than everyone thinks? Well, there are a, a couple of details here that matter. Uh, 
we are now in the middle of the biggest revolution in motoring since Henry Ford's first production line started running back in 1913. And it's likely to happen much more quickly than most people imagine. And many industry observers believe we have already passed the tipping point where sales of EVs will rapidly overwhelm uh, internal combustion engine cars. And uh, while the thing that really makes this change happen is an inevitable is an industri a technological revolution. And technological revolutions tend to happen very quickly. And to uh, give you an idea of the time schedule, uh, the writer of this article says that he thinks the EV market is about where the internet was around the late 1990s or early 2000s. And if you uh, look at this change with the internet, the internet did not follow a linear path to uh, being everywhere in the world. The growth has been explosive and disruptive, and it followed a familiar pattern that is known as the S-curve. And if you've looked at technological changes, you may have seen this uh, curve before. The idea is that innovations start slowly and are of interest only to the nerdiest of those among us. And EVs now are on the shallow sloping bottom of this S-curve. If you uh, compare the internet, the internet, you would have to say, really began on 29 October 1969, when researchers uh, from the University of California made contact with Stanford University uh, a few hundred miles away. And first they typed L, then O, and then G, and the system crashed before they could ever complete the word login. So that was the beginning in 1969. By 1980, there were still only a few hundred computers on the network, but the rate was accelerating. In the 1990s, then uh, tech, the tech savvy among us started buying personal computers and using them at home and at work. By 1995, there were 16 million people online. By 2001, there were 513 million, and now there are more than 3 billion. So you can see how this S-curve goes from the early adopter to the growth stage to market saturation. And uh, they say EVs are on the same track. The first crude electric car, as a matter of fact, was invented by a Scottish inventor, Robert Anderson. And it was, are you ready for this? In the 1830s. Uh, but it's only been in the last few years that the technology has been available at the kind of prices to make it competitive. And if you look at the EV's history, in uh, 1998, General Motors released their EV1. It only made about a thousand of them, and the EV1's range was dreadful. It was only about 50 miles. And so now we have these EVs that uh, often will have 300 miles on a single charge and things like the Tesla Model S will go zero to 60 in 3.1 seconds. They're amazing cars. 
And since the EV1, we've seen massive improvements in the motors that drive these EVs, the computers that control them, and the charging system, and in car design. But the real growth is largely due to the improvement in the batteries and in uh, the production of batteries. Just uh, 10 years ago, it cost $1,000 per kilowatt hour of battery power. Now it costs about $100. So the, there's been a factor of 10 price decrease. And that price decrease has got to the point where it's starting to be cheaper to buy uh, than the, inter the equivalent internal combustion engine. And in fact, when you now factor in the cost of fuel and servicing, uh, many EVs are already cheaper than the petrol cars. And energy density, the batteries are continuing to rise uh, and they're lasting longer too. There is a Chinese med battery manufacturer, uh, CATL, that last year released the world's first battery of powering a car a million miles. So they're making big improvements. But uh, the, and so as a part of this, the EV market is growing then uh, very fast now. If you look at this chart, there were all, no sales in 2010. And by 2020, the sales were more than 3 million cars, about 5% of the total market. But if you look at where we are on the S curve, we're just starting to enter the steep part of the S curve. The forecast now say by 2025, four years from now, 20% of all new cars will be electric. So the rate of uh, EVs sales will quadruple in the next four years. And they say by 2030, they'll double again and be 40% of new sales. I think those estimates actually are conservative. Now, one of the other things that is happening here is that uh, we are uh, going, the manufacturers, as they scale up production, are going through the learning curve. The more we make up something, the better we get uh, at making it and the cheaper is the thing. And this has been a big part of what is driving down the price of batteries and so electric cars. And because of the S curve and the learning curve, we're on a verge of a tipping point. And soon, I think maybe this year, uh, EVs will become cost competitive with uh, fossil fuel cars pretty much across the spectrum from the compact cars to the big powerful cars. And when that happens, the game for internal combustion engine vehicles will be up. This certainly is what Tesla thinks uh, Elon Musk believes that his new cheaper Model Y uh, will become the best selling car of any kind in the world. And uh, he says that our demand is the best that they have ever seen. So uh, this is coming with it. One of the concerns is, are we going to be able to build enough charging stations? And uh, the author of this article points out that a uh, 100 years ago, when uh, there started to be so many cards because of Ford's assembly line, then gas stations popped up almost overnight all over the country. So 
Uh, he thinks, don't be afraid of the charging stations. They will be there. And when you drive your new AV. Uh, any thoughts? <clears throat> yes, I have an EV and it wasn't expensive at all. Uh, with 30,000 miles, it cost about 13,000 is a uh, Nissan Leaf. Um, and also, uh, we know that Ford and General Motors have said that they're going to move fast to EVs. So if you were out to buy a new car, wouldn't you hesitate to buy a non-EV knowing that they might be obsolete pretty soon? I sure would. And what's going to happen is uh, when this change happens, the prices on the internal combustion engine used cars are going to drop like rocks because, uh, again, they are cost so much more to operate that a used one is not very attractive. And I imagine that the uh, prices of gas will uh, probably come down as uh, the demand for gas goes down as well, uh, just to attract in you know, the same volume of uh, that they can sell. Yeah, hopefully yes. they'll be looking for people to take gas for free just <laughs> to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I bet. I, bet. I, also, I also think that there's a real market. Uh, uh, lying there for uh, replacing uh, IC engines in existing cars. Can we just take the, um, the interesting thing too is we're all old enough to remember when washing machines were gasoline powered and you don't see them around very much anymore. I never seen that. <laughs> I, I never saw that, but no, they used to have them uh, wow. with a gasoline engine on it, with a foot pedal that you pressed on to. Wow! Okay. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I didn't think before, that, uh, I didn't think rural rural electrification that. in the United States. Many people had gasoline-powered washing machines. Okay. Okay. I didn't know that. Now I, you uh, would, Norman. You would also know about EV uh, fuel costs because you're in Mexico. And tell us what the electricity cost is in Mexico for at the charging station. Free for Teslas. <laughs> That's pretty cheap. We <laughs> we drove uh, from Ahi to Laredo and back, paying nothing for fuel, and I took my. Tesla in for its two-year inspection, and it came out to be two hundred and forty dollars. That was the first work I had done. Okay, <laughs> and that was an inspection after two years. Yeah, pretty amazing. Uh, very pleasing. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the other interesting thing is, if this is all going to happen by twenty twenty-five, we're all going to be alive, and we'll all see it. Yes. Be, uh, good. Yeah. Yes. Hopefully, you'll all be alive, Andrew. <laughs> and, you know, I think this will be kind of more visible than the internet revolution because uh, we see these vehicles every time we go out the door. I agree. It's going to be more visible. And I think it's probably not going to be as disruptive uh, as, as the internet. Uh, revolution long term. I thought one of the most interesting things about the article was the application of the S curve to so many different technologies. But the most alarming part of it to me was where it said that these things come so fast that we don't have enough time to look at them and see where the downsides are and what's going to happen. And yes. I think we're doing that right now with the EV too. Mm -hmm. I don't personally know what the downside is going to be, but I can't think of anything offhand other than maybe what do you do with all these batteries, but there probably are some. You know? But uh, not only what do you do with the batteries, what do you do with all the people whose job was to maintain them that is going away? What do you do with your automobile factory that is making buggy whips? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. so, it's, uh, 
a dense set of problems. And what I have to say as somebody who worked in my whole career in Silicon Valley is what I know the technologists are interested in doing is getting the next product to the market as fast as they can. And that does not even consider what are the implications of the products. The only thing they care is how many we can sell. Mm -hmm. I think there's still going to be a need for, for gasoline because there's so much heavy equipment and that's not going to change over that quickly. I mean, pe people have millions of dollars invested in, in heavy equipment. And so they're still going to need the gas. Right. They'll need some gas. You're absolutely right, Margo. I think that the demand for electricity is going to go so high that that gasoline will be diverted to generate electricity. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, you might be right. I know the oil company is look companies are looking for some place they can sell that stuff. Last year, uh, the, the oil companies were behind a doubling of the world's production capacity for plastics. Because the plastics are made from petroleum products. And we certainly need twice as many plastics. Yeah. Richard. If we move on to materials, the last two weeks have had different kind of uses for graphene. No longer is it about computers, but last week it was how to prevent paintings from being eroded. And today it's getting lactose free milk from graphene. Tell me about that. Well, uh, you know that uh, I've been calling graphene uh, the miracle material or something like that for some time now and it amazes me uh the new uses we're finding almost every week and so uh they have been looking at graphene oxide membranes uh studying them for things like water desalinization and dye separation. So there's an interest in graphene as uh, fluid filters uh, for a while. And then a uh, group uh, has been investigating the application of graphene oxide membranes for milk. And milk uh, typically creates dense layers which clog up the existing separation techniques which are based on a polymer, basically a plastic. And these graphene oxide membranes have an advantage when they're creating this porous layer and their filtration performance can be maintained better. They don't clog up in the same way that uh, the current uh, separations membranes do. And this means they have an enhanced uh, permeability to lactose and, and water uh, while they filter out the fat proteins and some other minerals. The fat proteins are the lactic acid. And so this uh, concentration of lactose and, uh, was that they get from the filter is much better, much higher than conventional means. So they do even a better job. And as I say, they don't get fouled by stuff sticking to them like the previous technology did. And so uh, these look like they are will be great to create uh, this uh, lactose free milk, which is the kind of milk that I drink. And uh, this demonstrates that graphene oxide membranes will be useful for the food industry, particularly the dairy industry, 
and they think they'll be able to do a lot of other things as well. One of the applications that they're investigating is uh, removing sugars from beverages while maintaining all the other things. So you could, for example, have your orange juice. It would still be a little sweet and it would have all the rest of the nutritional value, just less sugar. Uh, this high capability uh, to not be fouled in use also makes it uh, an ideal candidate for other applications like wastewater treatments on one hand and medical applications on another. So now the next frontier in graphene is the uh, superior nano filtration. <clears throat> Any thoughts? One thing is if you uh, Google graphene for CO2 capture, you get about 100,000 hits. And yes. uh, a lot of people are seeing uh, graphene as a CO2 uh, solution. Right. The I other did. thing is uh, graphene is to this uh, century what plastic was to the last century. And you wonder if there are unintended consequences and we'll see islands of graphene in the Pacific Ocean that uh, <laughs> cause problems. Well, That's uh, assuming the left, the room left. Well, I think the climate crisis we have now, you could call that an unforeseen consequence. So that's a problem with our technical life today. Yeah. The, the unforeseen consequences of people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, one of the unforeseen uh, consequences of us is that our billionaires can go to outer space or near space. Uh, and Richard says, and other people have, should they stay there? What's that all about? Well, the should they say there, in the case of Jeff Bezos, uh, they did a poll uh, about Jeff Bezos and having him stay in space won by a wide margin. And anyway, so uh, really in the last few weeks, both Richard Branson with his Virgin Galactic and Jeff Bezos today with Blue Origin, uh, both made successful trips into this suborbital space. In the case of Branson, he was about 50 miles up. That still is where they say space begins. And uh, Bezos was about 60 miles up. And so uh, both of them are uh, planning a space tourism business, and it was important for this kind of rich man space tourism that these uh, both flights were successful because nothing slows down the orbiting business like billionaires burning up in a rocket crash. And uh, it turns out uh, the Branson uh, plan is he's already sold 600 tickets for uh, his suborbital flight uh, for prices ranging from 200000 to $250,000 each. So he thinks it's going to be a big business and he's going to be able to generate a lot of revenue just taking people briefly up to the edge of space and getting them uh, having a brief experience of uh, weightlessness. Uh, SpaceX, of course, has more ambitious ideas and they see trips for tourists that will last several days. And uh, so 
the space tourism looks like it is something that is going to be starting uh, right about now, as soon as they can uh, get their tickets for the next flight. Uh, the uh, Branson's effort, they think they'll start to offer the tourist flight, flights next year. So that's getting ready to, if you'll pardon the expression, get off the ground. And uh, are you ready to buy your flight to space? I, I can't wait. <laughs> so I, I wonder how much uh, the, uh, uh, the environment is in, in, impacted by using those rockets that take off and then put people up in space for a few, few minutes or days and, uh, and then come back. They're well, burning I've... hydrogen and oxygen. The impact is negligible. And that's what Bezos spoke of. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it takes quite a bit of energy, though, to uh, separate the hydrogen and the oxygen. And uh, that would result in quite a bit of CO2. But they're not talking about that. They're not, and they're, they're, that's something they're working on madly, but still, uh, they don't have a good solution yet. But there is such a strong effort in green hydrogen. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And there are pieces of the problem that they have made substantial headway on. And so I, I think they'll figure out the rest of the problem before long. I think they should tax the uh, production of CO2. That will uh, produce uh, solutions to this problem real quick. That's right. And uh, one of the things that has happened recently is China has announced a carbon tax and people are laughing at them because it's so ridiculously low. The Chinese carbon tax is about $6 per ton. Uh, what they're talking about in Europe is $100 a ton. Yeah. So they're thinking along the same lines. Yes. But in the United States, so much of our methane production is related to petroleum leakages. Right. And that's so quickly fixed. Well, it's some, not of the, some of the leaks are hard to fix, though, because it comes out of the ground. Uh, but it's not a matter of one or the other. It's it's really a matter of both. But the met, the U.S. Uh, methane uh, leakages are just astronomical. Yeah, well, but they, they can they can still tax the uh, the equivalent of CO two in those methane uh, leaks, and I think. Uh, it'll be surprising how quickly they'll come up with some solutions. The captain off these things or whatever. I'm afraid for the U.S. to cure their methane leak, uh, they have to stop piping methane to uh, 100 million houses through pipes that are inherently leaky. Yeah. Pipe, pipes that are 100 plus years old. Yes, old pipes, yes, <laughs> yes. So that's why one solution I hear uh, for residential energy is to convert everything to electricity and just get rid of the gas altogether. Yeah. Richard, then moving on to the environment, which you were already talking about, this article says that this decade, the 2020s, are the make it or break it decade to address the climate crisis. Tell us about it. Well, there already, we've been talking about that uh, pretty much for the whole time today. And one example of the place that we're in right now is uh, people in California are talking about the feeling of terror 
that they have feeling like they're just at the beginning of a climate tipping point that has the potential to make the whole state of California uh, uninhabitable within the lifetime of the people who are there. And this is despite the fact that California is one of the ones that are doing well. They already have met their goal to reduce emissions to 1990 level. Uh, the problem is the next goal is they're uh, supposed to cut emissions to 40% by 2030. And uh, the people who are looking at this closely say they're nowhere near to doing that. And, you know, the problem, the big picture of the problem is scientists have said global emissions must fall to 20 to zero by 2050, 29 years from now. And to have a chance at doing that, uh, it's going to be much harder if pollution <coughs> levels do not decline steeply within the next 10 years. So this is the time we need to do it already we're at the place where besides the weather problems and issues like this that we've been facing uh the researchers now say that five million human deaths per year are due to excess heat that's more than coronavirus and I don't think excess heat has gotten nearly the press play that coronavirus has, and it's killing more people each year, and it's going to keep killing more people. There's no vaccine for it being too hot. And so uh, this heat wave on the West Coast, they think that in terms of seashore animals that more than a billion of them were killed during this heat wave so it's just a terrible problem and the you know there certainly are things that are being done that are incremental steps and we've talked about many of those and one of the things that is important is there has been an increase in public engagement with the climate crisis. Uh, it's hard to measure, but it's definitely growing. But there's still one problem, which is that something, there is something about the scale and danger of this crisis that really challenges human psychology. And, uh, besides all of the technical problems, our own habits of mind are something that we have to overcome to be able to take the steps that we have to do to save our planet. I would like to save our planet. It's a nice planet sometimes. Any thoughts? Well, I, I believe there's a 10 states in the West that are affected other than California, Oregon, uh, Washington State, and uh, Nevada, some other states. And it, the economic impact is also going to be huge because it uh, destroys agriculture and other things. But I remember reading that 30% of California methane production is related to uh, animals to, to cows and steers, oh. and that that's easily remedied, just like the uh, methane leaks from uh, petroleum are easily addressed quickly. Other things take a long time. Say government regulations, uh, Biden has proposed that the regulations for installation of home solar panels be alleviated because right now to to do anything in regulated states like california and hawaii uh requires endless endless work and that includes simple things like changing out 
uh, high consumption uh, air conditioners to, to uh, contemporary air conditioners. And in, in Hawaii, air conditioning is a major consumer of electricity. Also in, in Nevada and, and increasingly so in California, like we saw in June, I think it was when we had the rolling blackouts in California. The problem wasn't just the heat, it was inefficient air conditioners. Right. And certainly part of the recommendation in terms of residential inner use is to convert uh, everything to heat pumps like you're using. Yeah, of course here heat pumps aren't quite so important because we don't get too much chill. Yes. In IE. But yeah, heat, heat pumps are infinitely better than gas-fired furnaces. And as we see come on the market, hot water uh, heat pumps, like mm -hmm. now are used for swimming pools, but used for domestic water, uh, that will reduce uh, methane consumption dramatically. And that's within the next when, year. When you think of it, most of the heat that is in the earth now is in the ocean. Really a whole lot is. Yes. And oceanographers have said that the ocean currents are changing and that's what's driving sudden heat attacks in in the US and in other places. Even yes. in the Amazon, uh, some of the problem is that the change in currents has reduced the rainfall over the Amazon forest. Mm -hmm. And that has accelerated what man is doing to himself in the Amazon. My feeling is that as this realization begins to strike and people everywhere, even in Northern Canada and Northern Russia, realize that they are not exempt from drastic impact of climate change. The switch to we want climate change will be irresistible. And the, the thing is, how much time will we waste before, before it comes? Because once, once you, you decide to really tackle it, there's all kinds of things that can happen and be done. And it would be uh, an economic boom. It would mm -hmm. also be the biggest uh, lump of money to do all this is in the billionaire class. They own 50% of the wealth and, and rising. It went up amazingly during the COVID because they're collecting rents and so they own the, the existing resources when resources weren't, weren't being utilized. So I don't know if that's an optimistic look, but realistically, I, I, I think we'll be it'll be a really good S-curve as people realize they're not immune, so we better work together and, and face this thing. Well, I I'm think you're curious. right. Uh, it's going to take, finally, people have to uh, decide that this is affecting my life and the life of my children. And uh, we have to do something now, and uh, the actions, many of the actions that need to be taken are at the level of governments, and governments take uh, people power to get them to change. Well, Richard, if we want to move on to biology and genetics, we've heard an awful lot the last while about CRISPR, about editing genomes genomes and a lot of people are saying that what happens is up in the air will editing bring catastrophe 
or will it bring cures to terrible diseases? Which will it be? Can, uh, can this editing be controlled? Should it be controlled? Should the WHO take a lead on this? What do we think we should do about it? Now, this is, uh, of course, a big interest to uh, scientists. And it really was stimulated by uh, the uh, announcement in 2018 by a uh, Chinese biophysicist that he had used CRISPR genome editing to alter embryos that were implanted and led to the birth of two girls. Now, what he was trying to do was good stuff, and he was trying to make changes that would uh, prevent an inherited disease condition. So nobody can fault him for trying to do evil. But since then, uh, then the science community has been trying to figure out what to do about this. And now uh, the WHO has formed a committee of advisors. And this these advisors say that genome editing sh should not be used yet to make modifications in the human genome that can be passed to later generations. And uh, of course, the problem with WHO recommendations is they're not legally binding. They do have the power, though, to shape deliberations among governments and funding bodies around the world. So maybe they can bring about some kind of change. But uh, the problem with this genome editing is incredibly complex. On one hand, there are clin clinical trials of genome editing that have shown <laughs> promise in treating blood disorders like sickle cell anemia, cancer, and other genetic disorders. So uh, there are very promising work with it. <coughs> there are also are fears that uh, interest groups, for example, billionaires that want to live forever uh, and have super children can use the same kind of result to generate, for example, a generation of uh, super rich children that will have uh, also biological advantages in addition to all the financial advantages they have now. And maybe the army would like to use this kind of gene editing so they can make super soldiers. Or maybe the CIA would like to use it so they can breed a generation of very clever intelligence analysts. So uh, there are lots of implications and there are lots of concerns but uh you know what i the they're already using much genome editing doing research with animals and they're whether they do this work on humans or not they're developing the skills and the knowledge to be able to apply it to humans as soon as they feel like they're able to do. And I suspect whatever the rules are, the rich guys and the people interested in different forms of power will figure out ways to get around the rules and that uh, this could be either uh, the beginning of an age of uh, great wonders in uh, human development, or it could be the beginning of the end, one or the other. I think it's, I personally think it's great that the WHO is trying to do something, but I feel a little bit like they're like a figure when there is a rock rolling down the mountain who tries to stand up and stop it before it crushes them all. So, how about you? What do you think? 
Can we stop it? Should we stop it? What do you think? I don't think we can stop it. I mean, uh, there's always going to be countries that will not, a group of people that will not play by the rules. China is one of them. China is one of them. Yes, yes. The possibility that it was a leak from the Wuhan virological lab is sure scary. Because this uh, CRISPR could mean the, the launching of, of new biological viral weapons. That's right. And that uh, the biological weapons, uh, you could still develop them within this agreement because those are not things that are going to change the genome, human genome. No, but they offer a greater potential for damage to the uh, global population, just as we've seen with this uh, one pandemic. Uh huh. And even if there is international agreement, there doesn't seem to be any will to enforce it. Right. Like the uh, current business with China and the uh, hacking of Microsoft and all that was going on since about uh, 2008. And uh, the US knew about it, but uh, wasn't able to do anything about it. So I think that's why some of us think that uh, whatever the WHO Oh, wants to do, uh, they're going to have trouble doing it. Yeah. Well, Richard, if we want to move on from genetics, here's another amazing technology. It's called neuroprosthesis. How about restoring words to us with, if we have paralysis, we can have words by this AI brain computer interface. Tell us about it. Now, what they had done before, they've been working on this kind of problem for a while. And uh, of course, having scientists experiment on paralyzed people is uh, pretty much OK, because uh, you can see the potential benefits to them anyway, outweigh the risks. And so they're great experimental subjects for this. And what they have been doing before this experiment, one of the things that they were working on and has done successfully is build uh, brain interfaces that would let paralyzed people communicate by spelling out words one letter at a time. And this is a big step up from that and they are what they are doing is using brain signals that were going to the vocal cords brain signals that in a normal individual would result in speech and then reading those brain signals and then able to uh, essentially display words, not individual letters. So it's uh, a great breakthrough there. Uh, it's still in its very early stages though. And right now, specifically uh, with the one test subject they have, they developed a list of 50 words. And first with a general uh, population, they studied their brains and were able to understand uh, the brain impulses that resulted in sounds of either consonants or vowels. So they did that work first. And then with this test subject, they developed a list of uh, 50 words. And using this 50 word vocabulary, they were able to build AI routines that would uh, translate the brain signals that would go to the vocal cords 
and use them then to be able to, with fairly good accuracy, be able to uh, generate uh, the 50 words. So it's thought to text, basically, is the application. And uh, they are still working on uh, expanding the vocabulary and building up the speed. Right now, the speed they can go at is only about 18 words per minute. The typical speech is 150 to 200 words a minute. So they have a lot to do to get it up to typical human speech rates and to expand the vocabulary. But they really look at this experiment as a successful proof of concept. And I think that this is something that we're going to hear a lot more about in the coming months. Any thoughts? The work done in, in neuroscience uh, against Parkinson's and epilepsy has been particularly successful. Mm -hmm. Direct stimulation in the, uh, in the brain. Mm -hmm. And I have a, just come away from a visit with one of my classmates with ALS and he's no longer able to speak. And the only way he can communicate is with a kind of a laser pointer on his spectacles that he can point to particular words or phrases or letters on a chart. Mm -hmm. And so this would be good. The other thing that's interesting is, I don't know if you've all seen that the video of the woman who has taught her dog 50 <laughs> words and the dog presses buttons to uh, voice or vocalize these words. So they could use this same technique to analyze the dog's neural signals while he's pressing these buttons and then have uh, eliminate the buttons and the computer could just interpret what the dog wants and tell you right now. Well, there, I know that there are uh, studies going on with both dogs and cats to be able to not use brain waves, but to just use their vocal language and translate those to human talk. And this would be the next stage. I don't know if I want to know what my cat is thinking. Well, I know that animals are smart. You know, I. Uh... We have two dogs here, and one of them, uh, when we take them in the car, knows how to operate the windows. I wow. a particular knob, you know. And <laughs> so, <laughs> I never heard that before, uh, but that's a smart dog. Yeah, it is a smart dog. Uh, it must be a common thing, though, because uh, what we have is a Honda, and uh, there is a special knob in there that when you press it, uh, a little light comes on on the knob, and it uh, it uh, nullifies all the operations of these automatic window openers. <laughs> I think dog, that I think that's for people. children, not for dogs, John. Oh, I know. okay. Well, anyway, but <laughs> I know at our age we're not used to the problems of dealing with kids in our cars. No, that's right. I hadn't thought of that. But you're right. And you don't want to know just, what just your cat's to, thinking. Just to, just to uh, open up the dark side, if I were interrogating someone, this would be a wonderful tool. Because as soon as I ask you something and you say to yourself, I don't want to go there, boy. That's right. Interesting. Well then, Richard, moving on to our last story. We've heard a lot about the gut microbiome. What is it? How can we unlock it? And what is this huge significance they say it will be for our health? Well, it's, a, it's one of these subjects that is an enormous subject. Uh, the thing that has really opened up the research for the gut microbiome is the genetic sequencing tools that we have now 
because really before about 10 years ago, uh, it was hard, very hard to figure out what the microbiome consisted of. You know, there are all of these critters in there and to identify one of them, you have to separate it out and then figure out what you need to make it grow and then make a bunch of them and start to study, use that uh, population to figure out what the uh, item was. Uh, the human gut microbiome is about 2 kg, which is a little bigger than the average human brain. So we have more gut microbiome than we have human brains. And it's a busy little community. It consists of trillions of bacteria and archaea and fungi and viruses that together contain uh, at least 150 times more genes than the human genome. So it's a big complicated thing that we have just been starting to discover. And uh, presently, we don't really know how it works. So uh, there are these uh, bacteria and viruses and fungi have evolved all this time alongside of us. So we have evolved together. And uh, in, for example, in 2020, last year, uh, a uh, European Bioinformation Institute uh, was able to collect more than 200,000 human gut genomes and put them through their genetic analysis and identified more than 2,000 species of uh, critters in the microbiome. And of the 2,000 they identified, more than 70% of them, more than two-thirds of them, were unknown previously. So it's this whole vast world that we're just starting to discover. And what they do know some things now about it. Uh, one of the things is that it's vital to your body and you need to look after it. And if you look after it, it'll look after you. And there are things that they are seeing about the microbiome now is that things like depression and anxiety are fairly easily modified with changes in the gut microbiome. So the microbiome affects our physical health and our mental health too. Uh, studies suggest that having a diverse population in your gut microbiome is associated clearly with better health. One problem that we've had in at least uh, the last 80 years since the advent of antibiotics is that it turns out that our microbiome uh, looks like it has gotten smaller in the last 80 years, less diverse. So that's a health problem for our species. And they're not really, they don't, this is another thing that they don't know why. Uh, maybe it was the use of antibiotics. Maybe it was our lifestyle, our diet. Maybe it was the fact that we keep more cleanliness in our homes now and so our kids are not exposed to as many things in their environment and so they don't get as many bugs growing in their guts. Now part of the thing about the microbiome is the gut microbes do things that the human system cannot do. It lives off non-digestible particles, fiber mainly, 
And from that fiber, it produces thousands of metabolites, which are used by the human body. It also produces uh, vital short change fatty acids that are involved in immunity. Did you know that your body's immune system depends upon your microbiome? Your microbiome actually is an early warning system and helps your body develop immunity to new things you're exposed to. Now, your gut microbiome needs about 30 grams of undigestible fiber a day to, for it to uh, have the nutrition it needs to do what it needs to do. The average intake of fiber in much of the uh, developed world is only half of that. So it could be that one of the things you could do right now for your own health is to make sure that you have at least 30 grams of fiber in your daily diet. Uh, now, one of the things because of this fiber, one of the health problems that we have had, we have this modern low fiber, ultra processed, uh, high sugar diets that it turns out are real problematic for uh, the human gut health. And it's hard to know even what the problem is that this junk food is causing it. Uh, it's, they say it's not the fats and carbs and proteins, it's these other chemicals that are in it, which can include enzymes that don't get on the label or emulsifiers. They don't know much about emulsifiers, it turns out, but there are a few studies on animals on emulsifiers. And uh, the studies show that emulsifiers that are used like in your mayonnaise, uh, you get reduced diversity and more inflammatory microbes in your microbiome. And so there are these problems with the way that we're eating today. And one con conclusion that they can make, even though they're not sure about much of this, is that ultra processed foods are bad for your gut microbiome and we should avoid eating them regularly. The gut health, poor gut health is, shows up in a vast range of medical conditions, including obesity, degenerative brain diseases, depression, inflammatory bowel disease, and chronic inflammation. The microbiome is associated with processes all through your body, enough so just that scientists say the microbiome is associated with everything. And uh, one of the things that researchers have done now, there's a company, ZOE, that was formed recently that has the aim of creating personalized diets based on uh, what an individual's specific gut microbes need. In the U.S., it costs $360 for six months, and they give you uh, regular tests and analyze your microbiomes and are starting to be able to recommend individualized foods. And people who are doing this already are reporting uh, weight loss, improved energy levels without any calorie counting or any of these kind of traditional issues with diet or weight loss, just by changing, substituting one food for another is recommended based on an analysis of the microbiome. Now, in terms of uh, what you can do uh, to kind of preserve and maintain and build the health of your microbiome, uh, there are a few recommendations. The first is at least 30 grams of fiber a day. 
And if you're not getting enough in your diet, then supplementing, feed your microbiome enough of what it needs. Then uh, there are seven specific recommendations that they make. The first is they say, eat the rainbow. That is, choose colorful fruits and vegetables and try to eat 30 different plants, nuts, and seeds every week. 30 different plants, nuts, and seeds every week. And one of the ways you get a varied microbiome is with a varied diet. Eat foods rich in polyphenols. And that's advice that we all should love because this means we need to eat dark chocolate and have red wine and their health food. <laughs> Who can complain about that? The next one uh, is, I think, a little harder for Western diets, and that is to eat fermented foods. Uh, there are a lot of these fermented foods. The writer here uh, favors kombucha, kefir, and kimchi, as well as unpasteurized cheeses. And uh, it's worthwhile to look on the internet fermented foods and see what foods are on that list that are interesting to you. The thing about fermented foods is they are full of different kind of bacteria that run the fermentation process. And by having a different fermented food than you're used to, you increase the diversity of your microbiome. Another recommendation is more omega-3s. The research suggests a relation between the gut microbes, omega-3, and brain health. And I personally am all in favor of brain health. Now, this next recommendation doesn't have to do with us so much, but maybe our grandchildren. And they say, let the kids play with dirt and dogs. You know, do those things that we used to think, those aren't clean, but maybe they're not clean but they introduce healthy microbes into your grandkids' microbiome. So uh, cleanliness does not always help. And the last thing, which is something we can all do, which is avoid processed foods, particularly highly processed foods. Uh, and cut back on salt and sugar, both of which seem to affect the microbial diversity in your gut. So that's what you need to do to take care of yourself, and you have to take care of your microbiome to take care of your body. Any thought? Yes, yeah. uh, very much so. Uh, fecal transplants help build the uh, gut uh, biome. Uh, they had some popularity a couple years ago. I haven't read much yet about how uh, how that is is uh, proceeding, but it seemed like an in to have uh, fecal gut uh, uh, transfers mm -hmm. that offered some uh, tremendous benefit. That's right. I think they need to change the name for it because as a marketing guy, I don't know how I'm going to be able to sell fecal transplants to the masses. Well, yeah, um, maybe they'll be more available to us then. <laughs> Actually, I, I heard that originally they used to give it through capsules and uh, people could not swallow those capsules. So now they inject it through the rear end. Okay, that's right. Kind of like, kind of like endoscopy. That's right. The reverse of endoscopy, I think. <laughs> that's right. The other thing is I, I read somewhere that the uh, microbiome is almost, for each human being, is almost as unique as our fingerprint and our retinas. But there, there have been scientists who have been uh, mapping the genomes of every single 
organism in the microbiome, and they're finding that every human being has a very unique microbiome. Yes, yes, they're suggesting it can be used instead of fingerprints for identification. That's right. So I guess I, they I, have I, to I tell the criminal to give a poop deposit when he's booked into the jail. Richard, I just uh, want to mention I, that I as a child, like my mother would give me a piece of uh, dough when she was baking. I never washed my hands. So my dough and my bread ended up very dark with a lot of healthy dirt on it. <laughs> And you look healthy uh, now. Yeah, almost 82. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's three things I like about the, the microbiome. Once you, you can see everything about it is statistics. And so it's a lot like economics and that's good. Uh, the second thing is the a recent study showed that there's ties between your own genes and the biome you generate. It's not a overwhelming uh, thing, but it has a significant influence statistically on how effective your biome is. And the third thing, when you think of sugar, sugar has done everything to sell more sugar. This is a threat and it will be interesting to see how big sugar and other, uh, other foods like it uh, face this new challenge. Now, uh, one point uh, that your uh, comment reminds me of is that uh, it looks like they may have discovered the function of the appendix and that uh, the appendix looks like it's a reservoir for your microbiome. So in case something terrible happens to your gut, that it can start to replenish microbiome species from what it keeps inside. <coughs> well, Richard, th thanks for this session. Uh, it's been great. Uh, and we'll see everybody once again next week. Thanks a lot. See you then. Thank, Thank you. you for joining and see you in a week. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.